We are in a series called Unexpected Stories that uh, we only have a few of these left, and they have been so good. And today is kind of uh, part two of last week, because last week we talked about uh, two amazing friends, Paul and Barnabas. And this is the Apostle Paul, who even before he was the Apostle Paul, when he was just recent follower of Jesus, Saul, who was a Pharisee, and nobody liked him, it, when, and Paul became his friend. It, it's, it was that story. And um, it, it is kind of amazing how that happened. And, and so I'll recap a little bit. But this week is actually about um, soon after, not soon, a while after they first became friends, uh, a couple of years later, they were doing some amazing things together. And then they had this fight, this fight that was so big that they had to separate. And they had to go different directions. I have to say, I have never heard a sermon on this story. <laughs> but it's, and maybe you haven't either, but it's going to be a good one. Now, today's story, I have to tell you, I, I knew we were going to be doing it when, we, when I started thinking about Paul and Barnabas, because their relationship is so amazing at the beginning, and Barnabas is such a good guy. And, but I knew that you have to hear the, the next part of the story, and I'll be honest, it brought up some painful memories for me because, you know, years ago in the beginning of my ministry, I was a youth pastor right out of seminary. And Raylan and I became really good friends with this couple who were, who were part of our youth worker team. And we became very close, so close that when we were considering adopting uh, our, the teenager that we adopted way back then, they were instrumental in encouraging us. And I mean, I, I would say I'm not sure we would have adopted her had they not been a part of our life and us been talking through that. Their son is the same age as my daughter, Allie, who is now 15 years old. They grew up like brother and sister. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is, I remember people would say, so are you going to date? And, and yeah, it, Allie just then went, oh, why would you date your brother? You know, because they were that close. When I, I left youth ministry to start a church in Central Florida, this couple moved their family to become a part of that church. The husband even left an incredibly lucrative career to become, later on, to become our um, administrative pastor. And it, it was just such a, a close connection. And for those, you know, when we were planting that church and getting it going, it was just so awesome to be working with your best friend in ministry. Somebody who you had their back and they had yours. Somebody where you just got to deal with all of the complications and problems that happen in a church plant. And you get to do them together, feeling like, you know, you're, you're just this pioneer starting new stuff. And those problems and all of those, those things that we work through, in some ways, they really forged a relationship. But in other ways, they caused some problems. Because, you know, as the church grew, differences in our personality, differences in our vision started coming to the surface and were being exposed. We were starting to drift apart. Over time, we rarely did things outside of, of work anymore. And um, I think we were saturated with each other, because I, I know I was. And over the years, we started realizing that our philosophies of ministry concerning how a church should be led were becoming farther and farther apart. Our conversations when we had to deal with problems were becoming longer and longer because it was like we just could not agree anymore. And the disagreements were becoming more and more frequent until there was this day where it was obvious it no longer looked like friends anymore. We were co-workers, but not friends. And, and for both of us, it was an incredible loss because it hurt deeply that this amazing friendship was becoming so different. And we didn't know how to fix it. And we tried. We went to, um, we went to counseling. We, went, we hired a consultant to come and help us figure out if, you know, what we could do. And in the end, we parted ways. We had to. We were just on different pages in ministry and in life and in what we thought the direction of the church needed to go. And it was the absolute hardest separation that I have ever been through. It's been five years now, and I still think about it probably every day. I can't have any time mowing the lawn or where, you're doing, where I'm driving in the car for a long distance where you know you're thinking and you're just thinking. And I, I don't think there has ever been a time in the last five years where I haven't had extended thinking time, and this relationship and this breakup hasn't come to my mind all the time. 
You know, you think, what, what should I have done differently? What should he have done differently? And, and, you know, we both said we were sorry about how things turned out. We, we both admitted we, we, each of us were part of the problem. I mean, there, we were equally part of the problem. But the relationship was over. It ended. It was not a great example of how friendship should go. I don't share this to say, see, you need to become like me. You need to follow my pattern. Because that, that is not the case at all. In fact, if nothing else, this message today lets you know we are in the same boat. We are in this together because relationships can be really difficult. And, um, and the beautiful thing about today's message and the story of, of Paul and Barnabas that's helped me is that we get to see the end result. You know, it's been five years for me, and it's not over. I mean, they're still, we're still dealing with stuff. But for Paul and Barnabas, we get to see at the end them looking back and some neat things come about when we look at that. So on that sad note, let's all grab a tissue for me. Um, I know that I'm not the only one who's experienced broken relationships. I mean, there are broken friendships that have happened in here that have just been so big and so hurtful. There are you know, uh, situations, broken marriages for many of us. I mean, we, divorce has been either a part of our lives or the part of our, our parents' lives, and we've experienced that pain. And, and you, when you look at relationships, or oh, let me back up, in churches, I mean, many of us have had to leave a church in, in a very painful way. And so you go, you look at these, these relationships and you go, is there hope? I mean, we talked two months ago, maybe a month ago, about God using hard times. Can he actually use this broken relationship for good for his kingdom? Because it sure doesn't seem like it when churches and pe- they're, they're people, and which, by the way, churches are people. But, you know, when, when all of these followers of Jesus are struggling together because being a person, a human being, is just tough sometimes, um, can God use this mess for good? See, that's what today's unexpected story is about. And that's why I love this story. So let me, let me just review real quick, because that's what I do in my long introductions. Um, let's review a little bit about what happened last week, some of the specifics. Because you had one of the earliest Christian leaders, his name was Barnabas. And he befriends this new believer named Saul. Now, Saul was a Pharisee who was determined to end Christianity before it even got started. I mean, he, it didn't matter what the cost was. He was throwing families in jail. He even uh, approved the execution of one of the leaders of the Christian movement. So Paul, Saul is this guy who is just causing fear in the heart of every Christian around Jerusalem at the time. And then as he is going to a city about 200 miles north to find more of these followers of Jesus called the way at the time, uh, the risen Jesus appears to him and those who are, are with him. Paul is blinded. He is talked to by Jesus, which I was talking about last week, how funny that was, because all of the guys there weren't blind, and they knew that this voice was coming out of nowhere, and there was Saul talking to this voice that he assumed there was probably a person there. And this moment changed Saul forever. This was his defining moment moment. And he immediately began teaching that Jesus truly was the Jewish Messiah that everybody was expecting. He was the real deal. So when Saul started preaching this, all of the Pharisees and the other Jewish leaders who had killed Jesus, you know, a couple of months earlier, they were now targeting Saul for persecution. So after a while, he flees to Jerusalem where all of the Christian leaders are, the apostles, all those kind of people. And he's, you know, looking for a sanctuary, looking for some help. But the name of Saul equals death, <laughs> you know? And so he comes to this area. Everybody is like, nobody wants to touch this guy. I mean, this is Saul. This is the guy who killed people and put people in prison. And so nobody trusts him that he's become a believer until one guy steps in, Barnabas. This Christian leader who vouched for Saul shared that Saul's story was true. No, he really did become a follower of Jesus. He really, you didn't see him, but he was preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. And as a result of Barnabas, all of the believers in Jerusalem accepted Saul. So it was this kind of friendship. And I mentioned last week that the Christians, you know, as they got to know Saul, they began calling him Paul. 
Yeah, that's when his name changed. It was kind of, Paul was kind of a nickname because of the change that Jesus made in his life. I forgot last week to mention something else. Barnabas, his name was not Barnabas. That was his nickname. His original name was Joseph. But because of the change that Jesus made in his life, they started calling him Barnabas. And this is just so cool. I can't believe I forgot to mention it last week. Barnabas translated is the son of encouragement. That's Barnabas' name. I mean, his real name is Joseph, but everybody called him the son of encouragement because he saw the best in people. He risked his own reputation for people, like Saul. See, this encourager, he defended Saul. He, he, and eventually, which you know, we talked about last week, was crazy. He eventually submitted himself to, Saul, to Paul's leadership, and it was a great partnership. And they became this amazing team together that God used to take the message of Jesus out of the Jewish world into the Gentile world. And that's where we start today. Um, Because early in their ministry, the book of Acts tells us, so you can look at the screen. I'm going to be kind of jumping all over the New Testament today. So please forgive me, but it's all part of one story. It says, the word of God continued to spread. And there were many new believers. When Barnabas and Saul, this is before he became Paul, when Bar- and Barnabas was the leader. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission to Jerusalem, they returned to Antioch of Syria, which I put up in the top right-hand corner, and so you could see it, taking John Mark with them. So you have Saul and Barnabas, they, they begin earning the trust of the Christian leaders, and they start getting sent out. And in the process, they begin mentoring this man named John Mark in the process. And together, they were commissioned on what we call now the first missionary journey, which was basically Saul, uh, Barnabas and Saul were traveling all over the Eastern Roman Empire, starting new churches, helping people choose to follow Jesus, and then helping them plant churches to share the message of Christ. So, next verse. And I kind of, I hope you're good with it. Sometimes I put little silly maps, but I want to give you some perspective so that, because there's a lot of like names of locations and they mean, you know, you're like Salamis. I mean, where, where's Salami? I don't know where this place is, you know? <laughs> and so I just, so forgive my bad maps. I did not spend a lot of time, obviously, but it's for you. So, okay. So it says, um, there in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. And then it continues in verse 13. Paul and his companions then left Paphos, which is on the island of Crete, by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. See, you wouldn't know any of these names <laughs> if, if they went in the map. There John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. See, it's not the geography that's important here. What's important is that John Mark was traveling with them to three cities, and then he left them. Now, regardless of him leaving, this trip was a huge success. It was the trip that Saul's nickname became Paul. It was on this trip. It was this trip that Paul became the leader of the pair. Saul, or Barnabas and Saul, on this trip, became Paul and Barnabas. They headed back home to Jerusalem. They started sharing the stories about what God had done amongst the Gentiles and the apostles and all the Christian leaders were blown away. Because, and I I think it's funny because you can imagine Paul and Barnabas going back and they go to Jerusalem and everybody's sitting in a room like this and they just start showing the slideshow. These returning missionaries and everybody's, yeah, good long, long slideshows. And I'm kidding, they didn't have cameras back then. But, that, you know, you can just imagine they're sharing, but they're sharing stories that nobody was expecting because the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit was co- coming upon the Gentiles and their lives were changing. And the Gentiles were become, were, it was obvious that the Gentiles were becoming part of this messianic promise that they thought was only for the Jews. And I got to tell you something, this changed everything. The rest of the book of Acts focuses on the Gentiles, not the Jews. I mean, what Paul and Barnabas were doing was revolutionary. And it's so revolutionary that you and I today, if you are not Jewish, we are, and you are a follower of Jesus, we are Christians today because of that movement right there. It was that, it was that trip that changed everything. And we're Christians today because of it. Because what happened is, 
when they came back and shared that message about the Gentiles becoming followers of Christ, all of a sudden, the Jewish leaders were like, this is real. And they started telling them, go farther, go farther, go farther, make more churches, make more followers of Jesus, until one day it hit Rome, the, the center of the Roman world. And Paul, you know, that's, Paul spent a lot of time in prison in Rome. But it was in Rome that Christianity started spreading to Europe and Asia and Africa. And unless your heritage is not from pretty much every continent in the world, <laughs> we are Christians today because of that movement right then, back in the early days, because Christianity spread like wildfire once it hit Rome. It's crazy. So as they prepared for the next trip after this, this is when some crazy things start happening. It says, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. All of these new Gentiles were now believers. Let's go check on them. Verse 37, Barnabas agreed, and he wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them back in Pamphylia and he had not continued with them in their work. You can kind of feel the tension building. Verse 39. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. So you have this huge disagreement that takes place between best friends, partners in ministry, Paul says, John Mark let us down. He doesn't get another chance. But Barnabas, what's his name? The son of encouragement. He, he's like, Paul, I believed in you. I gave you a second chance. Nobody else would. I was on your team, and I'm going to be on John Mark's team. And what we're going to see in a couple of minutes is John Mark was not just a guy with them. He was Barnabas's cousin. So now we're talking families involved here. John Mark... For Barnabas, definitely deserved another chance. The disagreement was so huge, they were forced to go their separate ways. Paul and Barnabas went up uh, by, into Syria and Cilicia by land, and Barnabas and John Mark started sailing for Cyprus. And so you have these two different Christian movements now. I mean, two, two missionaries going in different directions. So who is right? You know, I mean, Paul, we know him better because he wrote most of the New Testament so most of us are like, well, I bet Paul was right. But then you're like, yeah, but Paul, Barnabas was being true to his character. He's the son of encouragement. Paul's like, the stuff we're doing is incredibly important, eternally important. We can't trust John Mark, therefore we're not going to go with him. And Barnabas is like, this is family, and he deserves a second chance, like you did, Paul. So who's right? In my mind, the answer is both of them. They're both right. They're both standing up for their convictions. They're both, they're both making the absolute best decision they know how to make with the information that they've been given. They're doing their best. They just saw things differently, and there was nothing they could do about it. I, I know there was anger. I know there was hurt, frustration. These men had sacrificed so much for each other and together. They have risked their lives together, but they were at an impasse, and they just could not continue on together. It was too much disagreement. Have you ever been there? <laughs> Me too. And it's a terrible place. But you reach this, this sharp disagreement, and you know that there's no more room for compromise. We've, we've done all we can do. We've hit an impasse. And maybe it, this happened to you in a friendship or in a church or in a marriage. Maybe it was a church that just seemed to be going a different direction than you. You know, so you, do you just scrap the relationship and say, forget it, I'm out of here? Is that what Paul and Barnabas did? Because if you read Acts only, that's kind of what it looks like happens. You never hear about Barnabas again. This was the end of Barnabas' story. For the rest of Acts, chapter 16 to the end, it's all about Paul and Silas. Hmm. But Paul's letters that he wrote during the rest of Acts for those many, many years, 
they reveal a very different story, and we're going to look at a little bit of that. Because years after splitting with Barnabas, Paul and started, uh, Silas, they start this church in the city of Corinth, way out in Greece. Uh, actually, I have a map. I had to start getting it spread it out, because you can see Corinth is like way farther uh, to the west. <clears throat> and um, after splitting, they go, they start this church in Corinth, and years later, those Corinthians, they were not the best church ever. They just, they seem to have lots of problems and they love stirring it up. And so Paul kept having to write letters back to them saying, stop challenging my authority. I'm like your dad. I'm the one, I helped you find Jesus. And, and he writes these words to him. He says, don't we have the right to live in your homes and share your meals? Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers, namely James, the guy who wrote the book of James, uh, do, and as Peter does? And so he's looking at this going, I'm serving you. I'm living my life for you. And, and you won't provide hospitality for us. You won't, you won't help us when we come visit you. And you know, some of us bringing our wives, you won't, you won't help us. And then he says in verse six, or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? You know, like Barnabas for the Corinthians Who's he? I mean, who's Barnabas? Because Paul and Silas, they started the church way later in Corinth. It's, you, you can find out about it in Acts 18. They split in Acts 15. I mean, how are the Corinthians even familiar with Barnabas? How would they ever know that Barnabas is a co-worker with Paul? Because after the split, it appears they still work together. They weren't competitors and they were not enemies. They had the same mission. They followed the same Jesus who said these words, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. That's the Jesus they both followed. And even though they split, and it was tough, and it was angry, and it was so sharp that there was no way to compromise, when the emotion started going down, they started working together. So much so that you know, 500 miles away, the city of Corinth is very familiar with both men. I would even bet that both men had visited that church and both men were a part of, of helping that. They took Jesus' words to heart. They continued working with one another. But what's even more interesting to me is how Paul comes to see John Mark. Let's look at these, some of these passages from years after the split. Philemon, which only has one chapter, so you don't put the chapter number. Philemon 24 says, Epaphras, you got to love these names. Why don't you name your kids Epaphras and stuff like this anymore? I know, Aristarchus and Demas. And, I mean, these are great. My fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus sends you his greetings. So does Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. So you're like, years later, Mark is a co-worker? Wait a minute. I mean, how is this even possible? that Mark would be a co-worker. Look at this one, Colossians 4. Got to love it. Aristarchus, who is in prison with me, sends you his greetings. And so does Mark, Barnabas's cousin. As you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. So now, not only is Mark a co-worker, Paul is telling the church at Colossae to make sure that he is welcomed as a fellow missionary. You're like, what in the world happened? Luke, the guy who wrote Acts, you missed a lot of the story, man. We want to know what's going on. Because Paul rejected Mark in the early days, but now he's working with him as a leader in the church. See, it seems that Barnabas knew something special about Mark that, we, that Paul didn't know. I mean, there was something in there. But what is the most telling of the verses is what Paul says in his second letter to Timothy. Because Paul is in Rome. His sentence was death. This is at the, 2 Timothy is the last book that he wrote. He is on his deathbed. His, he knows that he is about to die. And this is what he writes. Timothy, please come to me as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life, and he's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. And he's saying, Timothy, I'm about to die. Most of my friends have either deserted me or they're ministering in other places. Please come. And if at all possible, there's only one person I really want you to bring with you, Mark. 
He is the one I trust most in ministry. He is one of the most helpful people to me. I want him more than anybody else. Isn't that interesting that Paul, even though he originally rejected Mark, now has made Mark one of the most important people in his life. And Mark, this is what's really cool. You might not know this. Mark went on to become one of the most influential people in the entire church, in the early church. He became an assistant to Peter. And under Peter, he wrote down many, many of the sayings and deeds of Jesus that Peter was teaching. And we have those teachings today. Do you know what it's called? The Gospel of Mark, the second book in the New Testament. John Mark, the one who was rejected by Paul, is the guy who wrote the book of the Gospel of Mark. (laughs) And what's what's really amazing is that when you look at, like in, in the scholarly world, it looks like Mark was the first gospel ever written and was used as a source for many of the other writings. So you're like, this guy didn't just write the Gospel of Mark. He influenced much of the writing of the New Testament. Just blows me away. See, sometimes we can get this picture that everything in the, in the Bible days was all hunky-dory and everything was great. Everybody got along and everybody was fine and there were no problems, especially in the New Testament. We know the Old Testament, lots of problems. But the New Testament, oh, everybody got along and it just isn't the case. Because those people, they were just like us. They were real people. They struggled with different opinions, different ways of doing things. I think this kind of story, it's not just me. A lot of people think this kind of story is strong evidence for the authenticity and the reliability of the New Testament. Because these aren't the kind of stories you share if you're making this stuff up. You don't share stories that are embarrassing about your your leaders who love Jesus and talk about unity all the time splitting. It's these kind of stories that really make you know, this stuff really happened. This this is real. But the sad part is that most people, for most of us, it doesn't end out this way. It doesn't end up this way. That we don't usually work out our problems. when, When we break relationships, often we just stew in that bitterness and we let it consume us and we just, we reject the other person. It's so much easier to ignore people that you have had a big disagreement with than to work it out. Because even though Paul and Barnabas went in different directions, they did not allow bitterness to take root. They didn't. They didn't abandon the relationship. They parted ways, but their hearts stayed right. They stayed open to reconciliation and working together. They didn't avoid conflict. Too often we do. We stay away from people that we're mad at. We don't want to face conflict. Conflict. But see, that's not godly, and that's not healthy. God is smart. He's a big boy. He knows how we are. We are people who, we get mad over pettiness. We get mad over things that are serious. We don't like conflict too often, we, especially when it's people who are close to us. He understands that. I think that's why he included this story, because it helps us to understand that we need to value relationships, We need to take the hard step and work it out if at all possible. And there's so much we can learn. So let's talk about just a couple of things we can learn from this story. I mean, when is it okay to leave? When is it okay to leave a relationship, a friendship? When is it okay to leave a church? Or what about a marriage? See, I think what we can learn in this story is that separation, if it's necessary in that moment, because you, there's an impasse, there's some irreconcilable difference that you can't get over, that if we separate, we do not abandon the relationship. See, that's key. It's, separation can be okay. It can be healthy, but it has to have re- reconciliation as a possibility where we show grace and love. For instance, many people in here probably had bad, bad experiences with churches. You know, a church starts going on a different path than you. You just feel like you have to leave. My encouragement is make sure that if that happens, that the reason you're leaving is worth it. Make sure that it's, it's real. It's not simply a misunderstanding. It's not simply a preference. Man, I hate when they play that song. Oh, I wish that they would bring the whatever instrument back or, you know, how dare they take out the organ and make it a boat anchor. I know a church that did that. That's why I said that. 
it was a big party, and you can imagine there were people who were not party, partying about it. But anyway, you know, if the reason is big enough to leave, maybe it's like a theological difference that you, you, just, can't, you, you just can't deal with. You're like, I, ha- I have to leave. If you do, would you please leave well? Please. Because if you leave a church, sorry to tell you this, but you're still family. Regardless of the church you attend, we're all on the same team. We're on team Jesus. We're family. So don't gossip. Please don't talk bad about others. As a pastor, do not come to me and say, yeah, we used to go to that church, but you know, that pastor there, blah, blah. I don't want to hear that because I know you're doing the same thing about me to other people. Please, (laughs) fake it. Don't let me worry because (laughs) don't talk bad about the church, please. And dear Lord, do not post anything negative about Christians or churches on Facebook or social media. Please. Nothing makes us look pettier and sadder than when God's people attack their own wounded. Stop. Let's deal with this as family. We don't post stuff about the argument I had with mom on Facebook. Let's do the same with our churches. We exist for God. We exist for his kingdom. That's the bigger purpose. It's not about us. I hesitated to mention the next one because it's so tough. But what about marriage? I mean, there is no relationship more intimate, more holy than marriage. This one relationship represents, it's the picture God uses for his relationship with his people. What an intense relationship. I think that, I mean, and most of us would agree with this. This isn't that controversial, but we must, we need to try to do everything possible to work out a marriage towards health, right? I mean, we want our marriages to be healthy. And sometimes that does require separation because sometimes we need to take time to heal, to get healed, to to take time away to work on the marriage, and and, and that's okay, get healthy. But I think the the big struggle is that the goal of separation should be the potential for restoration, And that's so often not the case. Separation isn't just a waiting period so you can finally just break up. No, no, no. It's about working on the relationship. And what if the other person doesn't want to work on it? Because isn't that the way it often is? One wants to work on it, the other one doesn't. The definition of relationship is two people working together to love each other. You cannot control the other person. Don't try. Because that's just smothering. You love, you do the right things. Actually, there's a verse. Again, you don't hear this stuff in preaching in sermons too much, but there's a verse by um, Paul to Corinth because they were all messed up. And it says, if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer, so one spouse, follower of Jesus, one spouse is not, and the one who is not is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. So stay together. But... If the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, they will not work it out. You have to let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other, for God's called you to live in peace. This is a tough one. I'm not making it up. If you don't like it, talk to Paul. Um, because he said, you can't control the other person, but you can allow God to work in you. There's only one person you can control, you. So, No matter what's happening, you be loving, you be faithful, you go to counseling and get health and get healed because you can't control them, but you can't allow God to use you and to work through you. You are an ambassador. Your your ministry, Paul says in another place, is the ministry of reconciliation, but it takes two. And if the other person's not willing, you be available and you keep loving now, this is the tough one, and this is why this, is, this takes a, like, this is, this is a counseling session, not a message, but if you're in a relationship where you're being abused, hear me, get help. That is not what this message is about. Abuse of any kind, physical, sexual, emotional, verbal, it is not okay. It's not okay. Please don't accept the lie that you deserve it. You don't. It is not okay 
get help. So I don't want anybody in here thinking Don is saying that, yeah, somebody's abusing me. I need to just, I need to keep loving them and I need to keep being faithful and I need to, the, the best way to love is to get help because abuse is not okay. So please just know that is not what I'm talking, I'm talking about. Abusive relationships have to stop. Restoration might come later, but safety is priority one. Fair enough? Okay, good. I just want to make sure that you know that this message today is about broken relationships between two people who love Jesus and have come to an impasse. That's what this is about. And um, so like the relationship I shared at the beginning with my friend, my coworker, that's why this has been so hard because I too have to be open to reconciliation. That hasn't happened yet. And I'm still hurt. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> because I'll forgive. And then I'll remember what happened, some of the stories, and I get mad. And, and then I have to forgive again. And then, dang it, I remember the other thing that happened. And then I have to forgive again. <sighs> Healthy relationships are work. They're hard. But they're worth it. And I'm taking that one on faith. Because right now... I don't know how much I believe that. I do. But it doesn't feel worth it. It feels like pain. But when I look at their story of Paul and Barnabas, I go, it, it's worth it. It's worth it. God did things through them that have not only affected the world around them, I am a Christian today because of what they did. It's worth it. So when we choose to love even in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the anger, and in the midst of the frustration, we lift up Jesus. We lift him up. People's lives are changed. And the lives of so many people, so many generations are changed. So let me close by just asking you a couple of questions. Is there a broken relationship in your life? There is in mine. Is there unforgiveness? Is there bitterness stewing in your heart towards somebody? Friend, a family member, church member, an ex? Bitterness and unforgiveness is not okay. It destroys you. It destroys you. It gives the world a bad picture of who Jesus is. I wasn't going to put this verse, and then I was like, have to. It's for me. It says, 1 John 2.11, this is... you know. Very, very, one of the latest things written in the New Testament. It says, anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. You can't hate a brother or a sister and walk in the light of Jesus. And that's our call. We're supposed to love God with all our heart and love, our, love others as ourselves. And we can't love God with all of our heart if we're not loving people. So I ask you, please, make it right today. If there is a relationship, make it right today. When you get home, ask forgiveness today. Offer forgiveness one more time today. Don't wait. This isn't something that you say, yes, I will deal with in a month. If you have a broken relationship, please deal with it today. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, you've been all over my case this week about this message, and thank you. Because I want to offer forgiveness. I want reconciliation. I know there's a lot of people in here like me. We're struggling, and it's hard. We don't know what to do. We don't even know what next steps to take. So I pray for wisdom. Give us the wisdom and courage to do the right thing, to do what needs to be done to make the relationships right. It might not repair the relationship. It might not, it might not do anything. The other person might reject us. But that's okay, because we're serving you, not them. The other person might, you just might never be friends again or might never be close, and that's okay too. Again, we're serving you. Help us do the right thing because it lifts you up. God, there's so many needs I know that a lot of us are dealing with right now, and I can't even fathom what they, all, they are. So I pray that in each person today, you will speak to our heart. You will challenge us in the way we need to be challenged, and you will give us the courage to change and to be transformed through the power of the Holy Spirit because it is only through you it's possible. In your name we pray, amen.